begin with a quote from uh, the energy mix. I think, you know, you were quoted in a few places uh, from COP28 as saying that in eight years of attending climate talks, you hadn't felt so much like you were getting real about what matters. And this was on day 11 of COP28. And in particular, it was really centered around the introduction into the summit of this Arabic tradition of Majlis, uh, which you said had ministers talking straight about the realities of phasing out fossil fuels. You know, I just, it, it's it's a little bit now in the, in the past, but you managed to get something that no other cop had managed to do, right? At, at least mm-hmm. acknowledge that like the climate emergency is going to mean liberating ourselves from fossil fuels, basically transitioning away, I think was the, the final agreed upon language. Looking back, do you feel like COP28 was a success? What were the gains and where were their kind of lost opportunities? Yeah, you know, working on climate change, no win is ever a clear win. Um, so I would say that by many measures, COP28 was ex- was a success. And by many other measures, it wasn't. <laughs> and I think that that's kind of the nature of the game when you're working on an issue as serious as climate change, as pervasive, uh, as urgent, and, um, you know, as a, an issue where the necessary action to tackle the crisis hasn't been taken, it has been delayed for so many decades. And so it's kind of pushed us into this place where not, no one thing is ever going to be enough, right? We, we just need so much happening everywhere all at once. Um, and certainly uh, it's challenging to find any consensus-based outcome that has every country in the world participating in it that uh, that we're all going to be really happy with in the end. Um, and so, you know, that's what we have with the outcome from COP28. It is a compromise decision. It isn't the strongest possible language on transitioning away from fossil fuels that many countries and many members of civil society were hoping for. We wanted something more definitive, like an agreement to phase out fossil fuels by a certain date. Um, However, we did get fairly significant language that acknowledges that the key thing we have to unlock in this critical decade, and that phrase is used in this critical decade, is the acceleration of the transition away from fossil fuels towards renewables and efficiency. And um, that was a hard fought recognition uh, over years of campaigning um, from, you know, folks outside of the process trying to push international climate negotiations to finally name the cause of the climate crisis. Um, And it was also the result of years of campaigning on the inside from um, countries that were, you know, most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, um, really demanding that that these talks grapple with uh, not only the cause of the climate crisis, fossil fuels, but also the consequences. Loss. And this is, of course, this uh, agreement to launch a loss and damage fund that was finally reached and concluded mm-hmm. um, also at COP28 in Dubai. So, you know, so I guess it's a long answer to your question of whether it was a success. I would say, yes, it was very much a success, but no one success is going to be good enough on its own. And so it kind of depends now on what we do with what it what was decided at COP28. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, you talked about the causes and the consequences, but you also use that word consensus. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, you also use compromise, but like compromise and consensus, consensus are coterminous because you know, in 1994, OPEC demanded that any yeah. decisions made at COP had to happen by consensus. It was basically OPEC, it seems, that really yeah. managed to force that into place. Uh, but like that focus on consensus means that basically petro states can shut down the sort of really radical course correction that we need, I like I think. Um, but what I hear you saying is that, and, and I know that from your work with Destination Zero and the partnership with the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance, that the idea is to kind of keep pushing, to not yeah. like give up on COP, to recognize that there's significant work that can get done. Um, but you do need to think about how to get around some of the impasses prompted by consensus. 
Um, I guess I'm wondering about like the role of the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance international treaties and how they can accomplish the seemingly impossible from your perspective, you know, from the perspective of Destination Zero and, and yourself. Yeah. Yeah. This is such a, a critical question because I've, I've heard in conversations kind of in the aftermath of, of what we were able to land in Dubai, uh, this idea that, okay, we've kind of sucked everything we can out of the international process. And, and now we, you know, need, just need to kind of double down on, on the domestic arena and get governments passing the kinds of policies and regulations they need to pass, get them developing energy transition plans, get them to stop producing fossil fuels, et cetera, et cetera. All mm. of that is true, right? It is the case that um, the international process sends the signal and uh, that signal is then received by policymakers on the ground in country and by global markets, financial markets. Um, and so there's a ton more work to do in country and in those financial markets to make sure that that signal has the effect that it needs to. Mm-hmm. But I think part of why I was um, quite impressed with that conversation that happened in the Magellus that you talked about in the introduction uh, was because it was making so clearly this connection between the domestic and the international spaces, right? So we mm. heard the minister for, from Colombia um, speak up really eloquently about the pushback that her government received when they started putting in place the kinds of decisions and policies that we're asking every government in the world to put in place. Um, The Colombian government decided that it would accelerate its transition away from fossil fuels, both its its reliance on fossil fuels for energy and also its production of oil and gas and coal. Uh, Started putting policies in place to do that. Immediately, their credit rating was downgraded by Moody's Mm-hmm. And um, the Colombian president started being called out on the global stage for making decisions that were kind of out of step with the norm of um, of leaders and policymakers who tend to to make decisions in favor of ongoing fossil fuel dependence, right? Mm-hmm. And the Colombian minister said it: if we don't get to a place where the international system incentivizes governments to make those changes that they need to be making on the ground rather than punishing them, then no amount of work that we do at the domestic level is going to be able to break through, right? We need both of those levels working in tandem, pulling in the same direction. So we both need the domestic policy to be, to be developed and we need the international system to transform so that those domestic policies are actually incentivized rather than punished. Yeah. Learning how to do that is uh, a huge challenge like i think thinking beyond the nation uh thinking cosmopolitically about climate change it doesn't come naturally perhaps to people like it's a it's itself a a, a kind of a marginal blockage or a political roadblock but when it comes to canada like thinking about canada i think you know, when people think about oil, they maybe think about places like the U.S., which is set to like shatter records for oil production. Certainly Saudi Arabia, Russia, like Canada is right behind those countries. You know, yeah. CBC reported um, just at the end of last year that Canada's oil production is set to jump by about 10 percent over the next year and become one of the largest sources of increased supply around the world. We produce about 4.8 million barrels uh, per day of crude. And that figure could climb to about 5.3 million by the end of uh, this year. So like that fact combined with the new findings that the oil sands are actually many times more toxic than we thought um, is enough to make me completely overwhelmed and kind of angry. Right. Yeah. But still, like you have to hope that this will nonetheless be the moment where like there is the biggest opportunity to address like energy and injustice. Um, I guess, given the suspicious focus on abated versus unabated fossil fuels during COP and kind of like this language coming out of, of Alberta, especially of like Canada's oil being ethical, like, you know, relative to Russia's oil, for example, what do you think like this current moment looks like in terms of like the, you know, market's attitude toward oil, the uh, International Energy Agency's attitude toward oil? Like, what's the biggest headwind? What's the biggest tailwind in this current mm. moment? 
Yeah, so much to unpack in in that question. Um, but yeah, let's let's look. I like I like the framing of headwinds and tailwinds. Um, so tailwinds, what what has kind of propelling the acceleration of the global energy transition? Well, there's actually so much to say there, right? Like the International Energy Agency is telling us that without any additional policies, if we just kept it business as usual right now the demand for oil and gas would peak in this decade. Um, And so already we're seeing the cheapness of many renewable energies like solar um, and the availability of uh, of, um, services like transportation that kind of can run on clean electricity. We're starting to see some tipping points in these technologies um, that are really kind of catapulting the transition to renewables ahead. And we're also seeing um, in the last couple of years in particular, significant improvements in energy efficiency. So in, in the actual um, uh, improvements in the, in the ways in which the energy systems run and, and how efficiently they're able to make use of, of sources of energy. Um, And and again, the IEA tells us if we're able to kind of keep up the pace of those energy efficiency improvements that we've seen in the last couple of years and work hard to double them by the end of this decade, you know, we are on track for a a significant overhaul of of what is currently a kind of runaway or what has for many years, I guess, been a runaway energy consumption kind of habit. Mm -hmm. Um, We saw that in private investments in renewable energy um, began to outstrip investments uh, from the private sector into fossil fuels in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Um, Over 80% of the new power that came online last year came from renewables. You know, all these positive stories that are telling us the momentum's going in that direction. Mm -hmm. Um, And on the heels of the COP28 decision, we start to see some interesting decisions being made in global capitals. We have Biden putting a pause on U.S. liquefied yeah, yeah. natural gas and citing the COP28 decision in that um, in that uh, pause. We see the Norwegian Supreme Court uh, saying we find that these three fossil fuel expansion plans are... Um, out of line with uh, the government's duty to consider climate change. And again, citing the COP28 decision there, we see Saudi Aramco making a decision mm. to, to halt its expansion plans for the time being because global markets are so volatile. So those are our tailwinds, but the headwinds of course are significant. And, you know, you were talking about being angry earlier and something that makes me angry is seeing that, um, public investments in fossil fuels are continuing to grow. Uh, So we've got public subsidies uh, into into fossil fuels that are are really only getting bigger. And that's in part because the private sector money is leaving the space. And so governments are kind of piling in to Mm. shore up this industry while telling us that they're letting the markets decide. And, And in fact, they're not letting the markets decide. They're artificially rigging the markets in favor of the status quo. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've got something else that you pointed out in your comments, this shift of the fossil fuel industry into distraction world. So I often say, you know, for years, the fossil fuel industry denied climate science. Uh, they, uh, spent decades in a well-funded campaign to delay policies tackling the climate crisis. Um, they have deceived us for decades And now they're distracting us with their false solutions Mm -hmm. um, and telling us that we need to be pouring billions in support into things like carbon capture and storage um, rather than investing our political and financial resources into what we know works, which is renewable energy. So Mm -hmm. that's, I think, the major tailwinds that we're facing. And and a big part of how we tackle that is um, is f- through financial reform, in fact. Uh, yeah. So we need to get into that world of figuring out how the financial systems change to make mm-hmm. this a possible transition. Yeah, um, I want to definitely come back to that question of like financial mechanisms alongside these other really important components. But um, yeah, to kind of just kind of 
reinforce what you were saying. Um, I was reading a Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives CCPA report on the daunting path to net zero and um, direct air capture would have to increase by 4,600 to 5,500 times the current capacity for it to make any sort of impact, right? It currently is taking maybe 0.1% of the, you know, carbon dioxide out of the air. So it's, it's like a laughable idea. Uh, but the idea that one would fall for it is like genuinely scary. Um, and yeah, the other thing, I guess the, the direction I want to take it was, uh, you mentioned consumption, this idea of like a runaway energy consumption habit. I think that like we, that is something that people in the climate movement maybe don't talk about quite enough, right? Like uh, that same report talks about the fact that the growth in energy consumption has been exponential, such that half of all fossil fuels consumed by the human race have been consumed in the last 29 years. That's unbelievable. Like basically only in the 21st century have we consumed the sheer amount that we have. Um, I think the question would be for me, like, as you survey the sort of energy landscape in Canada and this complex mix that we have, um, what role does communicating about consumption play? Yeah. How do we talk about consumption without losing our audience, I guess? Mm. So I tend to, I tend to take a, a, a fairly cautious approach to, um, to focusing on individual consumption and, and right. here's why. The idea of a personal carbon footprint was invented by the fossil fuel industry. And they did that for pretty obvious reasons, right? They were like, hey, look over there. We're not the problem. You are. Mm -hmm. And I think something that often happens when people feel like, oh, they can't care about climate unless they're doing every possible thing under the sun to reduce their supposed carbon footprint. Uh, and many people can't afford to do a lot of those things, right? A lot of folks mm. can't can't necessarily choose not to drive or can't afford an electric vehicle. Uh, a lot of folks can't afford to go off grid um, by putting a bunch of solar panels on their roof, right? Mm. And when we get into a place where people feel like, oh, I can't care about this issue unless I personally am taking all of the consumer actions uh, right. that the world tells me I need to take, um, that's paralyzing. And, oh. uh, and who, what, who benefits from us being paralyzed? Well, the, the ultimate culprits of, mm -hmm. of the, of the problem, um, the fossil fuel industry benefits from us feeling like we, we are alone in this crisis and right. we can't do anything about it. The fossil fuel industry benefits from us feeling like this is our fault. So, that's why I take a fighting, right? And from the infighting exactly. of holding each other personally accountable for like being impure in our consumption habits, you know? Exactly. Such an important point, right? Of of kind of um dividing and conquering, right? Of oh, yeah. of those who are who are the best of the environmentalists versus mm. those who care but um don't have the life circumstances that enable them to make environmentally or climate friendly choices. And the reality is that it is the job of government to be making the climate safe choice, the easiest choice for us to make. Hmm. Um, and so ultimately, you know, while I do think we can each play a role in making decisions in our everyday lives as they're available to us to consume energy in a more thoughtful way, um, I ultimately think that the greatest power many of us have been, as individuals have is to vote in the decision makers um, who are going to make sure that a government, our governments are working to make it so that these choices are possible and easy for us to make. Yeah. Um, it should be easy for us to live in a very comfortable, energy efficient home um, rather than a leaky home that's costing us tons of money, right? Mm -hmm. um, it should be the easiest choice for us to make to get to school or work in uh, a clean and affordable way. Mm -hmm. um, and the people who should be paying for those choices, ultimately, in my opinion, are the people who've been hold hoarding the wealth that's been generated. Um, from the last uh, couple of centuries of, of producing fossil fuels, the wealthiest, until recently, the wealthiest industry that this world has ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to be 
raking in some of the money that that fossil fuel industry has been hoarding and governments in their and politicians in their pocket um and and using that to fund this transition it's not a it, it's not a you know i think we do maybe have to start talking as a society about consumption and our, our society's living within limits but i get cautious when it's yeah. put down to that individual level i really appreciate that note of caution you know it's um because it is so, it has been historically used as this red herring uh, when we do need to be thinking uh, in much sort of like broader structural ways about what needs to happen um, at the kind of macro level. And like, this is why, you know, and, and your comments help us, help us sort of like reconcile that macro level with the micro level um, in the sense that, you know, when we're thinking about the struggle for, kind of like climate action that can build momentum, right? That can build capacity. Yeah. We do need to keep coming back to the question of democracy, basically. Yeah, 100%. Um, and, I, you know, I, I sometimes wonder if the way that democracy works in developed countries makes it somewhat ill-suited to the task. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not going down the road of like, oh, we need uh, uh, an anti-democratic like takeover, but I do think like it feels increasingly like um, in Canada, seeing this kind of populist wave rise in the United States, seeing, you know, Trump, you know, uh, winning at least the uh, opinion polls. It feels as though democracy is is ill suited to the task of de mm -hmm. decarbonizing. For, but what I hear you saying is that you feel still that like democracy is a force that can make sure everybody's represented. 2024 has a lot of crucial elections in it, right? More than 4 billion people will be able to vote in over 50 national elections across the world. Yeah. Like it's a big year for democracy. Um, but do you, are you at a point personally where you feel like the electoral cycle is something we should feel emboldened by or should fear? Because some people I talk to um, in, who are doing environment and climate change work do have this fundamental fear that all of our gains can be quickly eroded by just a new ele electoral cycle. But yeah. do you see it kind of differently? Uh, man, these con it's such an important conversation. And um, I think about this all the time. <laughs> uh, in oh, particular, I think about, you know, what needs to happen in the United States, um, because I think the, the questionable democracy um, <laughs> that's happening in the U S yeah. uh, is, is really so negatively impacting so much of the world and holding a lot of the world back. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 we're talking a lot about UN climate conferences and time and again, it's not uh, the big, scary, bad Saudi Arabia that's necessarily holding back a, a strong consensus outcome in those spaces. It's so often the United States. And mm -hmm. I just got to say that out loud. It's the, it is the yeah. truth. Um, and for sure, I think in places where we see democracy so stymied in neoliberal capitalism, which it is in Canada and the U S in particular, um, it is, it can be really challenging to, to see the kind of like lasting policy change that we need mm -hmm. in order mm -hmm. to, um, have have lasting solutions to the climate crisis and and all the other crises that we are facing mm -hmm. uh concurrently today right yeah. um and we maybe see a little bit more success in some of the more kind of socially democratic leaning capitalist sure. democracies in parts of europe for instance um but they're struggling as well and they get a lot wrong as well right there's no mm -hmm. perfect model um so so what do we do given this situation that we're in well we we think of whatever tools we have at our disposal to try to lock in climate positive change and the long term, even through um, a significant electoral shift. And, mm -hmm. uh, and we work um, in building our communities uh, in order to avoid those kinds of um, negative electoral swings and in order to communicate across political lines uh, that many of us um, or most of us are affected by climate change regardless of our of our political affiliation right my mm -hmm. Canadian family is 
very conservative and votes conservative and they care about climate change. Mm. <laughs> and, um, and it is, I think, a shame that uh, Canada hasn't gotten to the same place that many other liberal democracies have gotten to where climate change is no longer a partisan issue. Um, um, and, and what tools do we have to kind of extend or to shore up the longevity of, of climate positive decision-making? Well, um, that was a big motivation behind the work that I did in Canada for years to get our, our first comprehensive piece of climate legislation passed in the net zero accountability act. Mm -hmm. Um, Governments can overturn pieces of legislation, of course, but it's hard and it introduces right. yeah. a new interlocutor into the mix, which is the courts. Um, it can be useful, I think, for there to be kind of independent climate councils. Uh, Canada now has two of them, the Net Zero Advisory Body, which I sit on, and the Canadian Climate Institute. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've seen some success in other jurisdictions that have climate councils like the UK of them helping, you know, it's not a silver bullet, but helping to lift um, the conversation about climate change in the country out of the the very short term um, election cycles. Yeah. Um, and this is, I think, a really important one for Canada and for many other places right now. We think about what else we can do with climate and environmental policies. <laughs> we think about how we make co-benefits of these policies that have positive impacts on people's lives, an intentional outcome of yeah. a climate and environmental policy rather than an, a, a, an unintended consequence, right? So it yeah. is the case that many climate solutions are already the most affordable solutions that we have available to us. Um, but we don't necessarily write climate policy in a way that is about taking advantage of that and communicating that to people and making sure that they benefit from those savings. Yeah. Um, and we can do that. And that's a little bit of the motivation behind this other piece of work that I've been engaged in recently called the Affordability Action Council, where we're trying to come up with some solutions that are really about locking in some of these benefits that can make a difference in people's lives. And it's harder to overturn those kinds of policies when people are feeling them and benefiting directly from them. Totally. Um, yeah, I think that's so smart. Like just the notion of trying to amplify, as Mitchell Beer says, um, opportunity and gain rather than loss and pain. Um, right. You know, like just amplifying it. I think that that there's like actually revolutionary potential in um, figuring out how to communicate in a lasting way, the co-benefits of these measures that like we're breaking fossil fuel to fuel dependency, not out of self-interest, but out yeah. of like compassion and care and, and a commitment to kind of trying to construct a better world. Um, you know, and you, you mentioned some of the things you're involved in now, but I think to kind of maybe personalize it for people or, or just give, give more of a kind of uh, a sense of connection I wanted to ask, like, how did you actually find your way to the climate movement? You know, like, I know you've worked with many organizations over the years, including the Ecology Action Center. Um, but I'm kind of more interested in the one of the earlier moments of realization for you. Yeah, there's a few stories that I tell. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was a born activist. I think uh, it was clear from the beginning that I would probably... Um, wind up in some sort of advocacy. I organized my third grade class into a letter writing campaign to protest cuts to education in Ontario under the Mike Harris government. Um, and I, you know, worked, I did organizing work all through high school and, and into university. Um, at that point, I was mostly planning protests against, it was like kind of early 2000s and it was anti-globalization um, mm -hmm. kinds of protests. And uh, and a lot of the work that I did at that point in my early activist career um, was more socially oriented, right? It was like mm -hmm. about how we're living um, together, food sovereignty in Toronto, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I took my first climate science class in university. And it really, that class really made me realize like, this is the thing that I have to dedicate my life to work on. And I've only mm -hmm. worked on climate change my entire career after graduating university. Mm -hmm. um, 
I I often think about um, reading Severn Suzuki's address uh, mm-hmm. to the United Nations when she was a child. I think many, like many uh, Canadian environmentalists, um, the Suzukis were pretty instrumental in my um, my awakening. Um, but here's maybe something that's a bit different for me than than maybe some of my colleagues. Like I find I found over the course of my career that often when we environmentalists are in the same space and we tell stories about what brought us into this work. I hear a lot of folks talking about um, the really beautiful relationships that they have with nature and Mm -hmm. having camped a lot growing up or grown up like close to uh, some bit of nature that they really cherish. And I certainly feel that love of the non-human world, but I grew up in like beside the busiest highway in Canada in a high rise apartment building. Like I didn't see my first live raccoon until I was like 19. So Hmm. I didn't have that kind of relationship to nature growing up. And a big part of what motivates my work on climate change is actually a love of people. I Hmm. really like humans and I think we can do better. And I think we can live happier, more fulfilled healthier lives um if we make some some societal changes that i think we need to make um in order to address climate change and also structural racism and also you know rampant misogyny and many other kind of structural injustices that um are are tightly intertwined and it is just about this it's about us building a better world together Mm -hmm. rather than incrementally reducing emissions alone. Um, yeah. So that's really my motivation. Yeah, I um, sympathize with that. Like I had a similar sort of upbringing, did not have that kind of uh, romantic connection to wild nature that people talk about in really moving ways, um, but did have this kind of crash course in human nature that felt, mm-hmm. uh, you know, very sobering at times. And, you know, even uh, friends that I have who are, who are specialists in climate adaptation will talk about how, like, they don't, they're not fans of camping. They don't really want to um, Mm. have direct exposure to, um, you know, untamed nature, but that isn't to say that they don't value it, Um, you know, and I think in terms of adaptation, I sometimes think it's also important for us to remind people that, like, as Kyle White has written, um worlds have ended already and like worlds are ending now like we need to adapt but there's no way to kind of adapt to extinction it's a dead end and and white's point is that it's also too late for indigenous climate justice that like many of those relationships have already been severed i wonder though if you think it's like worthwhile to just communicate to people that while we have to uh agree that like there is urgency to stop climate change. There are also kinship relations, to use White's term, that are broken and can't really be repaired. I had this really beautiful experience um, in Nova Scotia at the Tatamagish Center, um, which hosts really amazing uh, programming, um, including a, a series of programs on the peace and friendship treaties that characterize um, relationships between Indigenous communities and settlers in uh, the East Coast of, of Canada. And during one of these sessions, I was just talking about the guilt that I feel as a person of settler descent um, around this like irrevocable rupture, you know, mm-hmm. this broken relationship that feels unmendable. And in a lot of ways, um, it feels unmendable. And mm-hmm. um, this indigenous elder, this Mi'kmaq elder said, don't feel the guilt, feel the grief. Mm. And it's something that I've really carried with me. That was probably 13, 14 years ago now. And I really carried it with me because the, what she was trying to communicate to me was grief can be generative. If Mm. we are able to get in touch with our grief, grief is so close to love, you know? Um, they're so they're so deeply connected and i think feeling our grief allows us to then tap into the love that we have for whatever it is that we're grieving and that puts us in a place that can be productive where we can 
be generative from that space. Whereas guilt is something that can really isolate us. It can, you know, disconnect us from those, those feelings of, of love and kinship. And, um, and so that's something that I try to bring into these conversations is to say like, yeah, we have passed some tipping points already. (laughs) We have, we have already locked in some, we're already, we are all currently facing devastating impacts, all of us at this point, right? Nova Scotia, my yeah. Canadian family's home province has declared states of emergency now like five times in just over 12 months. Um, we've locked in some pretty devastating impacts, right? And And some of those impacts are these relational impacts that there's no like denying there's a rupture there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I, I think it is really important that we feel that grief and part of why we need to feel the grief is because we need that to help activate the love and to let that love, like compel our commitment to fight for every 10th of a degree of warming, mm-hmm. right? Like, mm-hmm. I know it's a bit of a nerdy way to put it, but I feel like, you know, we, we've learned so much about what ever, how much of a difference every 10th of a degree makes in terms of warming. And we're in this place where we just have to fight to claw back every 10th of a degree of warming that we can, because as you say, mm-hmm. we can't adapt. Like we, we can't right. adapt to three degrees of warming. No, it, we're already, you know, getting, we're pr- approaching the, the 1.5 limit and mm-hmm. we're not really doing a very good job of adapting to this. So no. we have to fight for every 10th of a degree. And a huge part of how we do that is by working together and by developing and investing in those relationships that will make the change happen. And I got to say, um, I've heard from indigenous, uh, leaders, this idea of like, we've faced the end of our world. (laughs) And I think Mm. in part because of that resilience um, and because of the worldviews that many indigenous communities have, they have so much to teach us. They're on the front lines of solutions Mm -hmm. to so many crises. And, you know, we are so fortunate in Canada to see the ways in which indigenous communities are leading the renewable energy revolution. And so, I think it is a huge priority in the, in our part of the world in many parts of the world to like for a part of that relationship re- relational change making maybe is the way to say it is mm. about um figuring out how we are able to be in league with in um cahoots with indigenous communities and like lifting up their leadership as we as we work toward these changes. Mhm. Yeah. And, you know, this is, you know, what I like so much about your kind of perspective is that you're clear about how much is still possible if we just start pushing in the right direction together. Like there's just like an overwhelming wave that can can be created by that. Um, And, you know, there's a book called The End of This World, Climate Justice and So-Called Canada that's written by, in part, you know, uh, the Cree activist uh, Angel Aluk. And like... I see in that book uh, a real, like, just a brilliant sense of how that change happens. They write um, that uh, the long histories of resistance teach us that change is unlikely to be linear. We hear about the biggest moments and wins and losses, like when a pipeline is canceled or built, but the impacts of social movements are often nonlinear, like when a struggle in one place lays the groundwork for a future struggle elsewhere, that idea of like relational change making, yeah. uh, as you put it, or like social tipping points, as I've heard it called. Um, I wonder if you think that these nonlinear moments where we do reach a kind of social tipping point that causes like a series of chain reactions is conceivable in this moment, where, as you say, there are all of these different competing crises. Um, and, and also, I guess, like in terms of that chain reaction happening, do you think that like that the headwind of jurisdiction in Canada is enough mm-hmm. or like the power of the fossil fuel industry as a headwind is enough to basically disrupt that chain reaction? 
I, I love this phrase, social tipping points. It's definitely one that's resonated with me through my work. And um, I, I had the pleasure of seeing Bill McKibben speak in Ottawa uh, the week before last. And um, something, it was at a, a speech where that was co- commemorating um, the anniversary of, of, or the, sorry, maybe the birthday of Mahatma Gandhi. And um, mm. something that he said, Bill McKibben, was that he thinks one of the two most important inventions uh, that we'll that we'll see in the 20th century when we look back is number one solar panels, um, which I love, mm-hmm. and number two nonviolent social movements, uh, which is I think such an insightful um, observation because I think the way in which the 20th century has given birth to and seen so much change from nonviolent social movements is really a historical tipping point of human civilization. Mm. And I would say we have seen some social tipping points when it comes to the climate crisis over the course of my career. Mm -hmm. Um, And part of what tells me we've seen that is when I hear people in everyday settings kind of talking about something that has just happened in, in my world, which can so often feel like a bubble. Mm. Um, one of those tipping points was on the heels of the intergovernmental panel on climate changes, the IPCC's special report on 1.5 degrees. So we were just talking about uh, how important every tenth of a degree of warming is. And part of why we know that is because of this report. And I was in South Korea um, for that report negotiation it was an incredibly hard fought battle within the nerdy halls Mm -hmm. of the ipcc to land that report Mm -hmm. and then i went to an esthetician a few weeks later after getting home to canada and she said um oh i hear we only got uh 10 years to do what we need to do to hold warming to safer levels and to have a member of the general public who isn't thinking about this every day have that level of understanding into mm-hmm. climate science. That was a huge tipping point. And th- that report changed the world. And I think COP28 is actually a similar mm-hmm. social tipping point for the climate crisis because I have been hearing so many people, and I hope this is true for you too, Scott, that are now making this connection between fossil fuels and climate change that is so obvious and that we all kind of knew Mm. but that we haven't talked about because the fossil fuel industry and politicians that they pay have done such a remarkable job capturing our imaginations. Right. And, and even capturing the term energy, right. And, yeah. and, and divorcing fossil fuels from fuel, like saying we are actually energy companies, right. Um, that absolutely. itself is a smoke screen. Um, and making that connection absolutely is crucial, but sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, not at all. No, like you're so right, right? They've their their influence is so pervasive. I mean, it is telling when government decision makers can more readily imagine a geoengineered planet that yeah. is impossible to really imagine than they can just simply switching to renewable energy that we know works, right? So yeah. as hard fought and as late in coming as it was, This year, 2023, it culminated in COP28, but it was a whole year of the world reckoning with the fact that fossil fuels got to go. And that, I think, is a huge moment. And it does honestly give me hope. So Mm -hmm. I I think let's it it is our kind of job now, though, to to own that and to translate that for the world Um, Mm -hmm. and to really help people understand you know, it's possible. It's possible for us to live our lives without fossil fuels, right? It doesn't mean going back to the caves. Yeah. <clears throat> um, this And this is like the, the tired trope that got invoked, right? That if you roll back uh, fossil fuel production, then we'll, you know, basically we're doing away with the thing that is the foundation of our entire civilization. Um, but yeah, the, the I, there's so much that I could pick up on. Um, I have a lot to say in particular about like, especially Bill McKibben now kind of doubling down on celebrating nonviolent struggle, given, you know, the kind of pushback uh, and, and celebrated pushback in some ways that um, he got in the wake of Andreas Malm's very popular book, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, where he does try and kind of dismantle uh, 
McKibben's argument for passive resistance and 350.org kind of enshrining that in the climate movement. Um, violence feels in the 21st century not the exception, but the rule. Mm -hmm. That that context of thinking about violence in relationship to kind of the violence of the fossil fuel industry historically and, and what it will do to the planet is something that is hard to communicate in some ways, but I think it does get us to a place where, place where we can at least politicize the allocation of resources to people. I, I, I mean, I think people feel the connection, right? And so when we don't go to that place, it actually is, mm. is it's not helpful. It's, it's not helpful for us to deny the lived realities that people are experiencing where the violence that's baked into many of our societal structures is absolutely visible in the violence that we inflict on the non-human world, right? And yeah. within our own societies, I think, again, learning from Indigenous thought and traditional knowledge and leadership, like uh, the violence that we see in misogynistic cultural practices in sure. so many parts of the world are also so reflected in the the kind of like architecture of violence that we see inflicted against mother earth and mm -hmm. um and and i think there the many would draw deep connections there so again when it's people's lived realities when folks in indigenous communities are talking about murdered and missing missing indigenous women and are drawing that connection directly to the kinds of violence that are that we inflict as humans on the not the non-human world like yeah it's undeniable um i think okay so a couple of things one on um do we you know is it justifiable then for us to respond with violence to this violence that we are that we are you mm. know experiencing and I, I absolutely think that yes sometimes it is so reasonable and i'm a big believer in diversity of tactics and mm. i think that there's room for a lot of people to do a lot of different things in response to the injustices that are being are being inflicted on our communities and our and our our daily lives. Mm -hmm. um, I also think, however, that we've maybe lost within our organizing communities uh, the the instinct for strategizing across a diversity of tactics and. Mm that's something that is we're really going to need um, in the coming years in particular is really thought being thoughtful about what makes sense as a tool where and when and how we can be supportive to each other because i we even talked about this earlier in our conversation there's so often kind of a a competitive -ness to like but my tactics better than your tactic um and i think we would benefit from uh, a more deeply held conviction that a diversity of tactics is what it's going to take. Mm -hmm. On militarization, this is something that we do not talk about enough in the climate movement. Mm. Um, in part, it's because it's so interesting when you start getting into climate conferences and the UN climate system, like you see how much the structure of that system informs the way we talk about climate change back home. Um, and vice versa. And so within the UN climate system, military emissions aren't counted. Like there's no right. official way that governments are expected to report on military emissions. And because it's so invisible in the international space, it's also invisible back at home. And it, we saw something similar on fossil fuels, right? It had been because of this action from OPEC in 1994, as you cited, Fossil fuels were invisible in the in the international space, and so it was possible for governments back home to continue expanding fossil fuels while claiming they were doing what they need to on climate change. So militarization is absolutely the next thing that we need, to, and I think we've already, because of the the connections that we are facing between these crises, between crises of sure. conflict and the crisis of climate change, we're already starting to get better at making those connections. Yeah. Um, but I think the climate movement needs to like wrap its head around demilitarization and climate mm -hmm. action in a way that we haven't quite gotten there yet. Yeah, Amitav Ghosh has a brilliant article in the kind of Feral Atlas project where he talks about this, that the Pentagon is maybe history's greatest single polluter. If you start to right. do the work of tracking it, 
um, yeah, unlocking that could be really significant, I think, in a lot of ways, just in terms of like, yeah, like you say, drawing the connections between some of these primary detonators. That's the term feral atlas use, these big detonators, really. My last question is in some ways about making the connections between past, present, and future. Like, I think in my work as a climate communicator, that's what we're trying to do. Um, and it's it's tricky to do it in a way that is itself bridgeable or translatable. Um, but you want to kind of try to plant the seed that things could have been different and that they can still change. The strategy that we sometimes use uh, municipally in our climate communication work is backcasting or like transformative scenario planning where um, you imagine, yeah, history converging on the present, but then um, branching out into various possible scenarios. Politically, it's more interesting to me to think about the, what those different branching paths involve. And basically, like, there are three elements that we use in our, our model. Funding and financing mechanisms, that reform part that you were talking about. Political will, um, so having the right elected leaders in place uh, mm -hmm. to be proper climate champions, and public will. If you have all three, the theory goes that you can kind of take flight and create yeah. transformative change. Like, does that resonate for you or do you feel like it's missing something? That's like, we're sort of leaving, a, we're, what we're leaving behind, if I can plant this seed, is like the private market, right? Yeah. Like, where does that factor in or does <laughs> it, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's so, it, it, that's, so yeah, wow, lots of thoughts occurring at once. So first of all, leaving at the private market, it, it the neoliberal mindset is such a, a strange one, right? Because so often we think within the neoliberal worldview, within the neoliberal paradigm, we think, oh, the market's going to take care of that. <laughs> and yeah. as if the market isn't a, a, itself an entirely constructed reaction to mm. those three levers that you just named, right? Right. Um, as if the market is is responsible for our responses rather than our, our responses being responsible for the market. And uh, and so I would say that um, it, a model that depends on the, you know, trifecta of political, social decision making and technological capacity as being what drives the majority of kind of decision making like yeah absolutely that makes a lot of sense to me mm -hmm. um and we need governments desperately to get back into the business of regulating the private sector and uh, that's mm -hmm. literally what they're for <laughs> um <laughs> mm -hmm. but when you were describing these this kind of these three ingredients i did have this thought of like the only thing i would add to that equation is courage Mm. And um, and that's a really important piece, you know. I think the difference between um, in in the social context. So my my academic backgrounds in anthropology and evolutionary biology. And evolutionary biologists know that evolution happens in two ways: extremely slowly and incrementally, or suddenly all at once, <laughs> and we're in a place where we've been addressing the climate crisis from an extremely slow and incremental pace and we've gotten to a place where we need an evolution to happen all at once quickly all at once and the difference i would say between those two paces in the social world in the social the context of social evolution is courage the courage to undertake this leap that is possible um, and just requires all of us kind of buying into it with conviction. Yeah, that's what, I mean, I couldn't have said it better uh, by any means. And yeah, that there are enormous, you know, world altering reasons for abandoning a fossil fueled way of life um, and that you can kind of step into it, right? It, yeah. there, there need to be these high level changes we need to decouple like emissions from economic growth and and like rethink that correlation. 
Um, and, and evidence shows that we've done that in Canada I know. in the last few years. Uh, yeah. Which is extraordinary. I was seeing that in the CCPA report. And, you know, I think the the kind of leadership that you've shown in the climate movement is a, is a huge part of the reason why. So I really appreciate you making the time to talk to me. Thanks so much, Scott. I appreciate that. Good to chat.